Nick, thank you so much for joining me. How are you? I'm great and thank you very much for having me. Wonderful. Well, listen, I want to go back a bit, actually, and, and find out what did you want to do when you were growing up? What was the plan? Do you know, the honest answer is not a clue. Uh, um, um, struggled at school, you know, pretty underconfident, not really spotty teenager. And what do I do? And, and dad, my dad said, you're good with people. Do, do, do something and do hotel management. I said, what, really? What's that all about? So I said, oh, okay, dad. So I ended up qualifying in hotel management, which was great because it launched a career, ran hotels all over Europe, actually. So it was, uh, it, the answer to your question is, by default, I ended up doing something that, that turned out to be great. Do you know what you want to do now? <laughs> wow. Not hotel management, that's for sure. Not with those hours uh, and the pay. Uh, do you know, I'm, I'm, this sounds very naff and cliche, I'm living the dream. I'm doing exactly what I want to do. I have my, like you, I have my own business. I love what I'm doing. I, um, I, I have some great feedback, which gives me such a big buzz because I, I, I hope that I help people. And I'm, I have my office and home, I here with my boy, my wife, so I have the balance between the family and the, and, and the work life that we all crave, don't we? And the, the odd holiday thrown in, Bob's your uncle. Yeah, I know, that's fantastic. It's lovely that you've used the expression, Bob's your uncle, because we're going to talk about family a bit later. But before we yeah. do that, yeah. tell me, who were your role models or who are your role models now? Well, funnily enough, and I know you didn't mean this, that's a brilliant question, because that links very much to my family. I, I had two. And, and this is, this might be quite of interest to you. I had two role models. One was my uncle. And I'm going to tell you very quickly about him and I'll tell you about my other one. My uncle, Uncle Ernest, uh, amazing man, went to Cambridge, got a 2-1, very bright, had an amazing business career. He worked for Nestle uh, and Beecham's. He became CEO of Guinness, the, the drinks giant, when he was 46. He uh, was ambitious. He was successful. He was driven. Um, his, interestingly, his communication style was pretty direct he was he was fairly tough demanding roof he knew what he wanted and he got it most of the time uh, but he had the, the rolls royce he had the, the large house the swimming pool so rather naively i associated success as a young man right uncle ernest you know right i need to be driven i need to communicate like him and that was that was one of but they had that but that's one i had this this is the dichotomy my other role model was ernest's brother peter who was my father now my father, equally successful, but in a very different, different way, he was an outstanding surgeon and he had a long and distinguished career. He became vice president of the Royal Society of Medicine, working with some amazing patients who I met. Um, he was completely the opposite to his brother in his communication style. He was a, a six foot six giant teddy bear, but he, was, he had this ability to take people with him. He, he, when you met him, you, me, anyone, Maria, you immediately, he had this, I don't know, is it charisma, is it? This ability to he'd look you in the eye, he'd listen to what he was interested. Um, he just won over everyone and everyone, but he was gentle. So I had this two role, you know, both very successful men, uh, but very different styles of communication. And I kind of naively, I'm, I'm afraid to say, well, I'm not afraid to say, I, you know, I love my dad. I'm sure you love your dad, don't we all? I, I kind of steered to Uncle Ernest because naively I thought, well, he's got all these lovely material things. And that's what I want as a young man. This is, the, this is the story, though. Uncle Ernest, unfortunately, uh, he didn't have the fairy tale lifestyle that I thought. He, he, in 1986, you weren't even born in 1986, Maria, but it's a long time ago. He, uh, unfortunately, was, was involved in the Guinness scandal, which, which, which some people will know, some won't. And actually, he was, he was in the end, um, sent to jail uh, for fraud uh, and theft. And false accounting. So there, there was one of my role models. Who, my, you know, it was very sad. It was a traumatic time, as you can imagine. Um, so there was I thinking, oh, that's the way to go. And suddenly that that bit me on the bottom. Um, and at the same time, I had this sort of moment of clarity. Actually, you know, sometimes when the answer's right in front of you, you don't see it. And my father was actually the best mentor, the best role model I could have. So he inspired me to do what I do today. And I I talk about communication. I have six skills, and actually they come not just from him, but he he started that process. That's a fascinating story. And um, it's fascinating that these two brothers who obviously grew, they grew up together, I'm assuming, yes? Correct. Became so very different. From, from an early age, it was quite apparent. It's, it's, it really is a Cain and Abel type of, it's, it's amazing how two people from the same parents can, can, can look the same, but be totally opposite in, in, in character and demeanour, 
in how they handle people. You know, both very talented, and, and, and Uncle Ernest was a very brilliant marketeer, and people said that. Got a bit greedy, obviously. And Dad was, was very different. But yeah, you're right. It's amazing how, how did that happen, really? But sad, actually, to be honest, you know, as you can imagine with, 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 with Uncle, what, Uncle Ernest, what happened to him. But that's life. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So tell us a little bit about what you do now. So I, along with the, 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 my dad's inspirations, and we'll talk about that later and what he gave me, I, based on communication, I go into organisations and companies and charities and schools and I help people, this sounds a bit ridiculous, I help people get on better. So my area of, of specialty, if you like, is in, is in communication, collaboration, conflict resolution, because and this is a bit of a generalization. I've worked with so many organizations over the years. I was counting them up the other day. It's over 300. And if I made one observation of, of especially the successful businesses, organizations, if you take a business or an organization as an entity, the success of that business is pretty much down to people interacting well with people. You know, I often say, if you, if you can't get on with people, you won't get on a business. If you can't collaborate with people, you wouldn't have a business. I mean, you, Marie, and you're, you know, you're a people person and you, without people, you wouldn't be where you are. It's the same with me. And, and I look at these organizations and businesses and especially today in this stressful, global, challenging environment that we live in, um, it's, it's more important than ever that people are able to communicate across geographic boundaries and functions and departments. And, I, and, and so I go into organizations and help teams function better. I help people collaborate better. Um, uh, function more successfully basically to improve performance and increase profit fantastic lovely i love that but how did you go from hotel management hotel, and into the, the 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 collaboration work that you do the communication work how did, a, how, what was that move that's a very good question so the, the hotel management was on in my 20s um so 30 years ago so i from that i actually did i worked for different businesses and did different organizations so i I helped run, set up and run a sports insurance company with a partner. We were insuring um, sportsmen and women at Lloyd's of London. I worked for a charity deliberately for a couple of years. I wanted to get a feel for that work. So I worked for the, the Institute of Charity Fundraising Managers. I was training fundraisers how to raise money, which was incredibly rewarding. Again, a people business. Um, quite difficult to live in London on 16 grand a year. That, that was the slight problem with that one. But it was, it was a fantastic job. And then I worked for a consultancy training company which was brilliant because we had clients like uh, Rolls-Royce, BA, DHL, Bank of England, all these companies. So it was a privilege to go in, work with these people, learn different things. And, 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 and it gave me, and this communication thing was my theme. And, and then I started my own business 10 years ago, working with Sainsbury's and Mercedes-Benz and BP and all sorts, and small companies and all sorts. And so really this, this my, dad's, my dad's influence and, and the, the knowledge I took from working in this diverse selection of, of organisations all over the world has given me six skills that I talk about now to help people communicate better. Fantastic. I'm, I'm going to ask you about those a bit later, but first sure. of all, I actually want to ask you about where did the name Family Man come from? Uh, so that's partly from my father, who who, uh, who gave me uh, m much of what I do uh, in the six girls. Uh, and also, one of the observations I made with, with working in organisations is actually, I think we all have two sets of families. I, I think we have our family at home and our family at work. And I think in many ways, organisations are like families uh, for various reasons. I mean, for a start with, your, with most people with their work family, they live together, you know, five days a week working eight, 10, 12 hours a day, in, often in one place or one location. Um, both sets of family at home and at work uh, are made up of different personalities and, and idiosyncrasies and peculiarities, certainly in my family. Um, both sets of families have a hierarchy. So at home, you know, you've got the, the grandparents, the parents, the kids, and the typical organisation, you know, the CEO, the board, the, the troops. Um, and, and of course, we, we, we don't have a choice. We don't get to choose our family uh, at home and we don't, often get to choose our family at work so you know the phrase you can choose your friends but you can't choose your family which which is the title of my my stuff um now having said so i, I do think there's a lot of similarities and the best organizations i've worked in Maria, are the ones where it is a bit of a family atmosphere you know listen we row we don't get on sometimes there's a there's a conflict of personalities and clashes yes but but you know we can take a lot from families at home and use them in our, think, in our families at work. Families at home are generally robust and resilient. 
uh, and good in a crisis. You know, they welcome differences and accept people's different quirks. Uh, I'll have your back though. I'll be very loyal. Yeah, I'll row with you. And I think there's a lot of stuff that family, that the good qualities that actually embed into families at work. So, so that's, that's an observation I make. And people, you know, people, a lot of people relate to that when I do my speaking. You can see in the audience when I get onto this bit, they go, hmm. So that, that's the family man bit, along with my father who gave me the inspiration. Yeah, no, I like that. I like that. And, and do you see similar challenges in the relationships at work as perhaps we might have at home in our families? Are those the sort of things you see? <laughs> it's, it's really, you're bang on. In fact, let me be honest, I think it's harder to, to, be, to, to, to be with your family at home than does at work. But I think we have in work, you know, we have that professional time. We wouldn't necessarily completely let go. I'm sure we're all going to be authentic, which is very, which is one of my six. But I think it's tougher, Maria, with your family at home and your family at work. Is 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 a personal observation. Yeah, no, I agree actually. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a different discussion. Yeah, yeah, sure. wine, yeah, quite, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. Let's not go into that now. So, so there are six. Um, what do you call them? Do you call them techniques? You call them skills, I believe. Yes. Uh, six skills. Yes, I call them six skills, qualities, and attributes. Because because three of them are skills, and a couple of them are more sort of qualities and attributes. Correct. Are you? Will you share them with us today? Of course, of course, I would. So 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 let me let, let me preempt that by saying, and I make no apology for this. Is, is they are simple. They are uh, common sense. They are things that we kind of know already. But especially in, in today's environment that we live in, I think they're tricky to do. And we often forget them. So uh, uh, with pleasure, I'll go through them. I'll give you an overview and then, then ask whatever you want. So, so the first skill I talk about is whenever you are interacting with someone, let's say it's one-to-one -one with a colleague or a client, whoever, um, the first thing to do is to pause. There may be a second, that may be five minutes, but that pausing allows time for you to take in the scenario in front of you and ad adopt the best strategy for how to deal with that conversation, whatever. And, it, and it's, you know, I, I, I'm, you and I are quite similar. I'm quite emotional and firing. I like to do things. Um, and it's very, you know, you, we jump in, don't we? And we can wing it and you can, like, we all do this stuff. And we, it's very easy to get engrossed in a conversation. Quite often what happens though is the emotional part of the brain uh, runs away with this and the logical part of the brain sort of tries to catch up. So um, I certainly have, and I'm not saying you have, Maria, looking back, dealt with situations where I didn't pause and, and the conversation went wrong. And looking back, I think, Nick, you idiot. You know, so, so the first, sounds simple, and especially in stressful situations, of course, you know, do we? You know, we've all done it, haven't we, where we've, mm, yeah. Um, so that's, that's the first one. And, I, and I, when I'm talking in my speaks, I, I talk about a couple of tips on how to do that, which is simple. The second action is to, again, very simple, is to listen and learn. You know, when we, the, the best communicators have that ability to almost get inside the head of the person they're in front of. So it's, it's not about you, it's not about what you're thinking, uh, it's about them. And, 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 and you know, it's, it's about who, are, who is this person? What do they really want? What, what, you know, it's studying them, it's observing them, it's, it's looking at the body language, asking them good questions, listening to their answers, but listening to the silence between the answers, the body language, be curious. And I know it's obvious, listening to them, we all do it. Um, but I think a lot of us aren't particularly good at it, especially in a stressful situation. So, it's the, so the first one is the pause, you listen and learn. And the third one, third one is, is, a, is a challenging skill and that is to adapt. So adapt, adapting is about, okay, I've understood the person in front of me. I see where they're coming from. I've kind of worked them out. How then do I, without being false and disingenuous or inauthentic, very important, without being false, how do I slightly adapt my tone, my voice, my language so that this conversation goes well? But, but it's really important not to be uh, someone you're not to be insincere that, that's really important this is not about when I say that it's not about changing your personality my personality it's our behavior how we behave is a choice so, so how can I adapt having worked out the person in front of me how can I make a small adaptation to the way I come across so they go I like him he speaks my language he gets it and, and that is a skill I think that is something that all of us can get better at when I'm when I talk about adapting uh, in workshops, actually, and in my speeches, um, I use a psychometric profiling tool, which, which many people are familiar with, called Insights Discovery. There are loads out there, my brains and disc. And Discovery is a great one because it's, it's a simple language and it, it puts us into four colors. So, so I actually, when I'm doing my work, I give people a tool to help them adapt. People love it. They get it. 
and it works. So, so the three main actions that, that whenever you're in front of someone is to, to pause, to listen and learn, and then you adapt without being disingenuous. Those are the basis of any communication collaboration. Brilliant. I love that. I love that. I know there's six, but um, yeah. I, let, let's, let's nope. leave that for another time, I think. Sure. But I just, just on the pause one, just for, uh, yeah. for you, of course, uh, being Italian, um, <laughs> and, and this is a Latin thing, this is a Latin thing. When God. we are enthusiastic and we are in the conversation and we are enjoying the conversation, we talk over the other person. And I, although I've lived in this country most of my life, because I come from an Italian family, it's very hard for me. The only time I pause, the only time I wait and I shut up is when I'm doing a podcast. <laughs> May I congratulate you? You're doing that beautifully. Um, <laughs> but you know what? Me too. I get that. And, and I'm awful. And it's because I'm enjoying it, because I'm enthusiastic, because I'm talking to someone, whoever it is, it could be a CEO or whoever. And my enthusiasm, I'm just like you. My enthusiasm is, is, and I mean well, and I want to, but often you're right, you end up over talking them and you, and you cut them off. My wife keeps saying to me, just listen, just Please. listen to me. Yeah. And um, she's quite right. Um, and I, you're, you're bang on. And, and it's something that we, it, it might be pausing just for a second. It's not, it doesn't have to be a 12 minute pause, but it's, we need to be better at listening. Let's just look at our politicians. Let's not go there, we'll, we'll avoid that one, but. You're, yeah, you're no. yeah, you're absolutely right. So um, what sort of results do you achieve then when you go and work with clients and you, you help them with these skills? So because I have a, such a broad spectrum of clients, so, so for example, I would, I, I had a lovely bit of feedback for, from, from a woman which has stayed with me forever, which was uh, who I did some work with. And she said, uh, you don't know this, Nick, but the, the, the work you did for me, I, I had to speak at my father's funeral the other week and I wasn't going to do it. And I couldn't do it. And it's only because of you, because of what we spoke about, that I managed to stand up there from the pulpit. And that, to me, was a almost one of the best bits of... I mean, obviously, I'm here to help businesses and reduce profit and help collaboration. But that was one of the uh, most powerful bits of feedback I got. I'll give you another one, uh, if I may. Um, and actually, I've, I've got a... It's only because it came through the other day. It's, it's a very short email which shows about the typical results I get. May I read it to you? It's not long. Yeah, of course. I actually had a lovely email from one of the events we did together. Is that the one you're going to read or is it a different one? Which, uh, which one was... Oh, no, it wasn't that one. Oh, that was a nice one. Yes, that was lovely. Yes. Um, uh, being a needy individual, obviously, I need good feedback all the time. But uh, this is a different one. This is a, if I just read it to you, it's quite brief. And, and, and this sums up the results I can get. So hi, Nick, I, I felt compared to write to you following your talk the other week. Your father's six skills resonated with me and I ended up using them yesterday in an important meeting with a difficult client. I've been trying to finalize a deal with him for six months. He's always been very aggressive and abrupt and wanting a transaction to be done in his particular way. At yesterday's meeting, I paused. Remember I made a real effort to listen to him and then I adapted my style to being more direct and upfront about the realities of how the deal should be structured. You'd be delighted to know that after 20 minutes, the, the client agreed to sign the deal. It's a 25 million pound contract that has just, just earned us 2 million net. Regards, David. <laughs> nice. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's nice, isn't it? Nice. But two observations. That a, that's the power of the skills and B, what an idiot I was for not agreeing commission. <laughs> Fantastic. Listen, tell me, do you yeah. practice these skills at home on, on you know, on the family? <laughs> I, I could call my, I'm at home now in my office, I could actually call in my wife and son who would sit down with you, Maria, and gleefully tell you how their father uh, slash husband uh, does not practice them enough at home and should be better at listening and pausing and acting. It is tough, as we alluded to, it is tougher at home. It's tough, you know, I get home from a long day, you're busy, I'm, I've been really busy the last couple of months, been away a lot, I come home, I'm tired, I'm knackered. It's so easy not to pause, not to listen and learn, you know, to be wrapped up in my world. So I, I, I do have to, as I approach the front door, remind myself, uh, Nick, this is what you talk about, uh, mate, you've got to show up and practice what you preach. Yeah. I, you know, I don't, I don't know if you find that, but I find that. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. Listen, I'm a bad example of uh, good communication because I get, str I, I have my Italian hissy fits. But anyway. no! <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Me too. Oh dear. So listen, finally, I'm going to put you in a time machine, and I'm going to take you back 25 years uh, to when you first started speaking. And yes, and I'm going to ask you now that you know all the things that you know, all your experience, all your all your knowledge as a speaker. What advice would you give young Nick? 
That is a good question. I, one of the things I would say to young Nick is make more mistakes. Uh, I, I remember as an early speaker, I wanted it to be perfect. I wanted it to be right. And I felt I couldn't let down the audience or the client or the bureau. And I, it had to be uh, an, an, any little thing that went wrong. I, I beat myself up. And do you know what? I would, I would say, I, I think we learn, well, I certainly learn more from the bad things I've done. I remember my bad, but very few of them, Maria, if I, if I say so slightly, slightly, slightly boldly, I remember the, the, the speeches where I didn't hit it out of 10, where I didn't really knock it out of the park. There aren't many, but I remember those vividly and clearly as opposed to the ones that went well. So I would say to young Nick, make mistakes, mate. That's how you learn. Be brave. But I think that's one of the things that came to my mind as you asked that question. I do think also, Nick, that often speakers are much tougher on themselves uh, than um, the audience will be. And audiences, if they're with you, they're, they're quite forgiving. But yeah, no, that's really good advice to, to, you know, make more mistakes, but also be kind to yourself when you do. I'm not very good at that. You bang on. I'm, I'm not very good at praising. And, and some of the emails I get and I tell my wife, oh, here's an email. And she says, you should, I'm so proud of you. I say, yeah, whatever. Anyway, what's next? You know, and I, I, I'm not I'm not good at that. You're right. Don't lose that. I love that. Thank you, Nick. Absolute pleasure.